Bien, Nathalie Goulet et moi-même sommes très heureux de vous accueillir au Sénat dans cette belle salle René Monori, dont, dont les décorations pourraient laisser à penser que la France n'est pas un pays laïque. Mais si, la France est bel et bien un pays laïque et respecte bien évidemment toutes les, 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 euh, les pensées, les, les opinions euh, religieuses. Je suis moi-même président du groupe d'amitié euh, France-Yémen euh, au Sénat. Euh, mon collègue euh, Fabien Goutefarde n'a pas pu venir, il est à l'Assemblée nationale et nous avons eu l'occasion avec euh, Madame Goulet de, de nous déplacer il y a quelques mois via l'Arabie Saoudite pour autant que faire se peut apprécier la, la situation et il nous a paru intéressant de faire le point à travers une approche juridique sur euh, la situation au, au, au Yémen. Je n'ai pas répété ce que nous savons tous, ce que vous savez tous sur la situation, tant sur un plan humanitaire que sur le plan militaire. Toute la question est de savoir comment on peut sortir de ce guépier. On avait le sentiment, il y a quelques semaines à peine, qu'il y avait peut-être des, des pistes pour arriver à une situation de paix. Et puis, et puis, il y a eu un événement militaire qui a fait s'éloigner cette, cette perspective. Voilà, je ne serai pas plus long sur le sujet. Euh, Nathalie, tu vas sans doute dire quelques mots. Pardonnez-moi de ne pas parler en anglais, mais mon anglais étant trop approximatif, je préfère m'exprimer euh, en français. Ben, merci, Président. Donc nous, nous, nous sommes heureux de, de vous recevoir aujourd'hui dans une, une configuration un peu intimiste, mais qui ne rend pas le sujet moins intéressant. Euh, moi, j'ai également présidé le groupe France Yémen il y a quelques années. C'est un pays que je connais bien, où je suis allée plusieurs fois. La situation est extrêmement difficile. Elle est difficile pour les Yéménites d'abord. Elle est difficile pour la communauté internationale. Elle est difficile dans, dans son acception. Et il y a quelques semaines, un rapport des Nations unies a été rendu. C'est le deuxième ou le troisième. Et, et nous avons pensé qu'il était intéressant d'avoir un œil juridique sur la question. Parce que finalement, bon, Michel dit que c'est un oxymore, les, les lois de la guerre. Mais enfin, c'est vrai que la guerre est, est normalement... Euh, un, un sujet qui, qui n'est pas réglementé, mais et finalement qui qu l'est quand même un peu. Donc nous, nous, avons, nous avons imaginé la, la venue euh, du, euh, du professeur Somos qui est, euh, qui est présent. Et, euh, et également, bien sûr, cette réunion se tient sous l'égide de, de son excellence l'ambassadeur du Yémen en France, qui est l'autorité euh, qui représente ce pays euh, dans le nôtre et aussi au Portugal, je crois. Donc vous avez une traduction et puis euh, la, la réunion est euh, aussi en direct sur Twitter. C'est pratique, après elle sera enregistrée. Et, euh, et donc vous pourrez vous exprimer, je pense qu'on en a pour une, une petite heure. Mais je crois que le sujet vaut la peine d'être abordé, même si le contexte national est compliqué euh, ces jours-ci. Nous n'avons pas voulu déplacer la réunion qui était, qui était prévue, parce que je, je crois que le sujet le mérite. Donc merci de nous avoir rejoints et puis euh, merci Michel pour ta présidence. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here today at the esteemed French Senate. Uh, on behalf of the Yemeni government, I would like to take this moment to extend my gratitude uh, to Senators uh, Nathalie Goulet and uh, uh, Michel Amil for the arrangement of this event and for their continuous and consistent concern and work for Yemen, uh, both with events like these and behind the scenes. I have had many conversations with Nathalie and I am impressed by her commitment to the country, when many may have understandably moved on from a situation that continues to complicate itself every day. Indeed, it is a deeply complex and frankly confusing 
situation right now where it feels like every day we are trying to catch up with what is happening. But it's important for us to remember that at the heart of this are real people who are seeing suffering like no other. And we cannot lose sight of this. The context, the environment, the motives, and the interest, the law, it is all therefore necessary to understand. This is why events like this are so crucial, because instead of taking the easy option of looking away, they help us in making sense of what is happening. And this clarity will help us to understand what we can do and where we can go. I therefore want to thank very much Professor Mark Somos for taking the time to be here. I very much look forward to his talk, and I am sure we all here will benefit from his expertise and insight. What is happening is due to decades of bad governors, a butched unification, and unnecessary aggressive coup by the Houthis, foreign intervention by Iran, and now the eruption in the south. Nevertheless, we continue to hope for just peace, in which all voices are heard and are taken into consideration. The people of Yemen deserve more than just a promise of short-term peace. Instead, we must attempt to achieve peace in a way that begins the foundations of a healthy and flourishing society that have the real potential to achieve the economic, political, and social aspirations of its people. Uh, I will end by thanking you all for being here. As a country whose problems are so often forgotten or ignored, even a desire to learn more is not taken for granted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I would like to thank Senators Guli and Amiel and His Excellency, Ambassador Real Yassin for organizing this event and all of you for coming. The situation in Yemen is routinely described as the greatest humanitarian crisis of our age. And I don't have to remind you of the suffering, which we usually, but unsuccessfully, try to capture by reciting the number of people killed, starving, displaced, sick, or at risk. The numbers and the images cannot encompass the still undetermined harm, also down to future generations, especially if we fail to do our best. So perhaps a less obvious point than the cliches and numbers is that we are all responsible by virtue of our shared humanity. And it falls to us to find the best way to help. I don't have the charisma or the imagination to be a politician, nor the skills of an epidemiologist. So please let me try to make a public international law contribution. Institutions are often useful in responding to mass crises, such as the one in Yemen. The United Nations is a top tier institution we normally look to for guidance and action. Among the UN organs, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has been compiling fact-finding reports about the human rights situation in Yemen since 2012. In September 2017, they delegated this task to a so-called group of experts, which produced its first report at the end of August 2018. The government of Yemen and the coalition, in contrast to their reaction to the previous reports, categorically rejected the group's findings. During debate in September 2018, many other states joined Yemen and the coalition to express serious concerns about the group's work. New criticisms have been emerging continuously since last August. And I believe that from a legal perspective, this is a major problem and a bottleneck or a catalyst for harm rather than for improvement. 
The Human Rights Council and the High Commissioner for Human Rights have a tremendous potential to establish accountability and responsibility for the atrocities in Yemen. They are the closest that humanity has to an organ that can help to stop the conflict. And through credible records and guidance, support reconciliation and healing. The HRC and the High Commissioner explicitly named these tasks in the, in the group's mandate. So an ill-advised report squanders trust in the UN, undermines the credibility of officially established facts, and in vital pragmatic terms jeopardizes future mechanisms of transitional justice, reconciliation, and long-lasting stability. Cases and studies of post-conflict fragility consistently show that if parties do not believe that responsibility was allocated justly, the conflict will start again. You cannot end wars without justice. And this context explains why I believe that the group's reports have a unique importance and potential for good or for ill, and why it's important to discuss the latest report today. So in my view, if we accept our shared responsibility for the sufferings of the people of Yemen, it is essential that we understand and discuss why and how the group's first report damaged the HRC's role as a credible fact-finding authority and a platform where Yemen's government, the coalition states, and the entire international community could examine the facts and look for solutions. The group's first report was fundamentally biased and unreliable. When the report was discussed, many states found it shocking that it included a list of names from the government and armed forces of Yemen and the coalition whom the group accused of war crimes. That kind of personal attack never appeared in previous reports, and it is unlikely to be a constructive contribution. Last year's report also claimed to cover the period from, from September 2014 to June 2018. Most of the incidents and most of the serious violations that the report describes took place while Qatar was part of the coalition, but Qatar's state and individual responsibilities are never mentioned. The report also ignored the responsibility of Houthi Saleh forces, Al-Qaeda and Daesh. Of the 150 or so incidents that last year's report covered, the experts attributed responsibility to the Houthis for not a single one. However, they attributed every alleged violation by so-called proxy forces to the coalition. Both the silence over Houthi responsibility and the misattribution of all responsibilities to state actors only might have happened because the experts were unaware that responsibilities of non-state actors can be expressed under international law. This, however, however, is an unlikely explanation, given the experts' training and the tremendous contrast with all previous HRC reports, which overwhelmingly focused on Houthi responsibilities between 2012 and 2017. So there must be a, another reason for last year's striking omission. Again, in contrast with HRC reports from 2012 to 2017, the group failed to describe its method. As state representatives noted while discussing the report, the group had very limited information from which they drew definitive and damning conclusions. Their categorical allegations were incommensurate with the evidence, unreliable and irresponsible. In addition, the group mischaracterized and misattributed responsibility to the government of Yemen and the coalition for all issues, including non-specific, overall systemic food insecurity and cholera. The sufferings of millions of Yemenis is not all caused by these forces, but by the civil war that these forces are trying to stop. It is unfortunate that the group's hyperbolic allegations with misrepresented facts and untenable causal inferences led to a loss of credibility. That, as we saw, can only harm Yemen's cause. There were many more tendentious and biased allegations in last year's report, including the group's unexplained summary dismissal of the work of the Joint Incidents Assessment Team, despite GIOT's findings that some coalition air strikes were mistakes for which responsibility must be allocated and compensation made. Some, though not all, of 
the report's serious flaws that I have mentioned were presented in detail by the coalition to the HRC, as well as by Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE in separate communications. The coalition, as well as China, Great Britain, Japan, and other states also pointed out multiple serious problems with last year's report that I haven't mentioned, since these criticisms are publicly available. I won't review all of them. Instead, I offered a, a few new ones, but my point is this. When they adopted Resolution 36-31 that created the group of experts in 2017, the states, including the coalition, placed their trust in the new group to examine all human rights violations and abuses. Whether through incompetence or bias, the experts had betrayed this trust. The mandate was renewed last year when the majority of states agreed that the information the group presented was incomplete. Yemen and the coalition notified the UN that they disagree with the mandate's extension and will cease to cooperate with the group that produced such a report. The group's second report is dated the 3rd of, se 3rd of September 2019. It was made public on the 24th, less than two weeks ago. My view is that although the group of experts had lost credibility, trust, and cooperation, it is important to assess their second report. After all, despite the understandable misgivings, the UN did renew their mandate. Though unreliable and so far damaging, the group still holds the potential for establishing facts, attributing responsibility, and help to pave the way toward transition and reconciliation. It is for the sake of the prospects of reconciliation and restoration that I'm pleased to say that I think that the new report is better and it's for the same reason that I deeply regret that it's just not good enough. The group incorporated many of the coalition's criticisms, and though they don't spell this out, they reversed many of last year's positions. This year, the group explains this method does not automatically attribute acts by non-state armed groups to the coalition, and it is much more careful about proclaiming criminal responsibility. The group also discusses incidents previously omitted, such as the Houthi forces blocking access to grain stored at the Red Sea Mills, which is enough to feed 3.7 million people for a month. And it is less, mis less dismissive of Jihad, noting some cases in which Jihad found coalition forces responsible. Unfortunately, major flaws remain and new ones are added. To see how the report exceeds the group's mandate and derails the process it was supposed to serve, we should begin with the hermeneutics of bias. The group states that once, they get, once again they had limited access to information, especially after they alienated the coalition. Once again, they drew incommensurate conclusions, although this time less carelessly. They described some Houthi violations during the bat Battle of Aden as, quote, a sample of incidents considered indicative of the main patterns of violations, unquote. And attribute, quote, emblematic cases of assassinations, unquote, to groups that they claim are associated with the coalition. Murders by Houthi snipers and grave, grave crimes in Al-Hudaida become, quote, a sample of emblematic incidents illustrating the pattern, unquote. Emblematic is a very frequent term used by the group to support claims of widespread and systemic human rights violations, and this is a weakness. Given the detail in this 144,000 word report, the incidents can stand on their own to establish criminal responsibility. There are so many for every major event and location in the Yemeni conflict over the years that making broader claims on the assumption that the numerous cases are emblematic backfires and weakens the report. Alleged cases of torture in alleged coalition secret prisons, namely Abu Raiko run by the UAE and Altin run by Yemen and Saudi Arabia, according to the group, can and should be investigated by the relevant authorities. The group, or HRC, can transmit the details to Yemeni or coalition military justice by turning incidents into emblematic cases of alleged systemic patterns of violations and relying predominantly on confidential evidence to do so. The group prevents national authorities from investigating even though it is primarily the national authorities function to do so under international criminal law. 
in accordance with the principle of complementarity. Alongside emblematization, almost all the evidence cited is unverifiable. The 274-page report has 1,689 footnotes to substantiate the group's claims. The vast majority of footnotes reads, quote, confidential sources on file, unquote. Now, one could argue that the group is answerable to the HRC, and it's not their decision and job to transmit specifics to national authorities. Yet the extensive, almost exclusive re reliance on sources that they made confidential, coupled with the aforementioned method of emblematization, paints a different picture. The group has to emblematize incidents and rely on inaccessible sources to be able to repeat what they did last year, namely to append to the report the names of high-ranking government and military figures as suspected war criminals. This is, again, irresponsible because it is counterproductive to the purpose of reconciliation and completely unwarranted by the group's evidence and method. Noting that they confidentially submitted many more names to the HRC, supported by evidence that these individuals and their states cannot respond to, and emblematized to stand for broader allegations, allows the group to cut out national authorities from the normal chain of accountability under international criminal law, and improperly jump to the highest possible level of accountability first. They may be doing this to bring a rhetorical pressure of implausible war crimes allegations on the parties involved, but whatever their reasoning, the group's method backfires and squanders even further public and interstate trust for little or no reward. This may be why when a few days ago states voted on the report and on extending the group's mandate, the international community showed even less support than last year. Even though the new report is better, and although they don't spell it out, even though the group reversed many of its previous positions, as we saw. Last year, the vote was 22 yeses, 8 noes, and 18 abstentions, compared to 22 yeses, 12 noes, and 11 abstentions now. In effect, numerically, last year's abstentions turned into votes against the group this year. But perhaps the most striking change from last year's report is that this year, the va vast majority of alleged human rights violations and breaches of the laws of war and international humanitarian law are attributed to Ansar Allah, whom the group calls, quote, the de facto authority exercising government-like functions and territorial control over certain areas of Yemen, unquote, and to the Houthis, described as a non-state armed group supporting Ansar Allah. According to the group, the de facto authorities and the Houthis have reached a level of organization where they become banned by international humanitarian law, customary law, and even Yemen-specific treaties, such as those against landmines. Uh, sorry, anti-personal landmines in particular. Under these standards, the group finds them responsible for anti-personal landmines, murder, collective punishment, enforced, enforced disappearance, use of indiscriminate weapons, arbitrary detention, arbitrary detention, torture, violation of fair trial rights, child, child recruitment, forced displacement, rape and sexual violence, just about every crime under international law. And they discuss several incidents of each. This is a, this is a more accurate legal analysis of the responsibilities of non-state actors than last year's silence of Houthi responsibility and misattribution of all alleged violations by so-called proxy forces to the coalition. But the group's report still falls short on non-state responsibility. As the shift from the standard of effective control to overall control signifies, there is an increasing appreciation that invited states' support for local forces does not necessarily mean that such states have actual and complete control over such local forces. Moreover, in recent cases, such as the Harman decisions in August and September 2019, U.S. courts described the Houthis as proxies of Iran. Iran doesn't only support the Houthis with weapons, money, training, and direct military assistance, but the Houthis would not be able to do most of what they do without Iran's, Iran's support. The group's new report doesn't reflect the relevant international standard of overall control, and in claiming to allocate responsibility, it doesn't take into account proxy force dynamic 
that meet not only the new, but the group's, but even the group's own outdated legal threshold. So the group offers a better but still flawed legal analysis of non-state actors' responsibility, their assessment of the coalition's alleged violations of the principles of distinction and proportionality has not improved since last year. The 24th September 2019 report is laudably more detailed about the group's thinking. Last year, they mostly just asserted that the coalition failed to distinguish between civilian and military ob objects of attack and misjudged the military benefit of airstrikes and blockades in proportion to civilian damage. Yet the applicable legal standards of proportionality laid down chiefly in the Rome Statute, Article 8, 2B, 4, and the ICC's elements of crime, Note 36, acknowledge the difficulty of foreseeing military advantage and civilian harm, the near impossibility of balancing the two, and allow for a margin of appreciation and the fog of war that investigations by Jihad and, and Yemen's National Commission often seem to meet better than the UN's group of experts from a technical legal standpoint. Though the group's new report also claims to cover incidents since September 2014, Qatar is again absent from attributions of responsibility, although it was part of the coalition for more than half of the time period covered and during the most intense violations. Iran is barely mentioned, except for a reference in footnote 1448 to the fact that their arms transfers violate UN sanctions in the context of the comparable responsibilities of the US, the UK, and France. Barely, or not referencing Qatar and Iran, was a puzzling feature of last year's report as well. Journalists since then have suggested that Mr. Kamel Jandoubi, the chairman of the group of experts, may hold the explanation. I have a particular interest in this unfortunate possibility, given my former post as research director of a major project on institutional corruption at Harvard and my ongoing focus on corruption in international law. Mr. Jandubi is a frequent high-profile guest in Qatar, chairing meetings in Doha, for instance, 11 days after last year's report was published, and numerous times since then. He is president of the Cairo Institute, which devotes country pages to alleged human rights violations in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE, not in Qatar. The press had accused Mr. Jandubi of improperly influencing Tunisian Tunisian elections in the past to secure the victory of, for the Ennada party, the Tunisian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Two days <coughs> after an early draft of this, year, this year's report was published on the 9th of September, Mr. Jandubi appeared on Al Jazeera to spend 48 minutes criticizing the coalition. Two days later on Al Masira, quote, owned by the Houthi movement, unquote, according to the BBC. And the next day on al Mayadeen, quote, quote, a joint venture between the Iranians and Rami Makhrouf, unquote, cousin of Syrian President al-Assad. On these occasions, Mr. Jandubi gave a distorted account of the report by focusing on his allegations against the coalition and not on Houthi responsibility as the report does. These facts, particularly when taken together, led public international lawyers and the press to question Mr. Jandubi's fitness to lead the group of experts, especially as the concerning facts correlate with the biases of the report itself that numerous states have pointed out. To sum up, in terms of technical standards, the group's first report was a very poor quality work. Politically, it caused Yemen and the coalition to withdraw its cooperation, and numerous states that are not direct parties to the conflict to criticize the group's work. Many of the group's positions, as I described, were reversed in the second recent report, which shifted the focus of responsibility to the Houthi side. However, not least due to repeated and new major flaws in this year's similarly unreliable report, it unfortunately seems impossible to recover the trust of the international community and of the parties in the conflict. This is reflected in the worst voting balance for the report and the group's mandate, and there are serious concerns about the fitness of the group's chairman for his role. The performance of the group of experts is very worrying. It needs to be addressed at every level, from UN to the national fora, by politicians, press, academics, and civil society actors, who believe that a credible, trustworthy, and respected mechanism for establishing facts and responsibility 
are indispensable for justice and the eventual much-awaited transition to an, to an enduring peace in Yemen. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Alors, avant de donner la, la, la parole à ceux qui le souhaitent, je voulais juste faire une petite remarque. Bon, d'abord, cette approche que je vais qualifier de juridique me paraît tout à fait euh, intéressante. Et il ressort de, de ce que vous dites, euh, si je fais une analyse extrêmement à, à l'emporte-pièce, que euh, des exactions sont commises de, de part et d'autre et que l'erreur peut-être du premier rapport avait été de trop charger je peux m'exprimer ainsi, un parti plutôt que l'autre. Pour autant, euh, peut-on, comme j'ai parfois l'impression que vous le dites dans votre exposé, peut-on réduire l'échec des négociations à, à la mauvaise rédaction d'un rapport, fut-il celui de, de l'ONU, et quid de véritables volontés politiques, non seulement euh, de, des belligérants, mais aussi, et vous l'avez évoqué à la fin, de l'Iran et est-ce qu'on peut parler, mais bien sûr on sort du cadre de ce que vous avez exposé, de guerre par procuration entre ces deux grandes puissances du Moyen-Orient que sont l'Arabie saoudite et, et l'Iran. Pour ma part, je ne poserai pas d'autres questions, je laisserai ensuite la, 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 la parole à, à la salle, comme on l'a dit. Peut-être que Monsieur le professeur prend plusieurs réponses en même temps, ou il peut répondre à celle-là, celle, celle du président d'abord, et puis répondez à celle du président peut-être d'abord, et puis on, on verra ensuite. Thank you very much. You are, you are absolutely, absolutely right, and, and that is the key, that is the key, key question. But, uh, in a sense, I'm, I'm just a technician. International law is supposed to support where, wherever the political will directs the lawyers. And if international law is misframed and abused, it cannot do that. You're absolutely right about the, the, the power relations in, in the Middle East, and that is the, that is the broader question that needs to be discussed. However, as a legal technician, I'm absolutely certain that with broken and abused and ill-fitting tools, it cannot be done. And because I see the group of experts report as, as pressure at a point in legal terms, as the actual most vital key that we need to fit to this particular problem, that, that, that happened to be my focus. It is, it is the most striking uh, uh, mistakes that they have made, such as ignoring non-state actors, including the Houthis. In the first report that led to the coalition's, I think, quite understandable withdrawal from, from cooperation. And while they have improved their performance in the second report, it is still far from achieving a level of performance that would enable the political will to, to move forward. It, it has become a hindrance. It is no longer a help. That was my very limited point. Merci. Oui, bien sûr. Madame Goulet, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur aussi, peut-être une remarque à ce qui vient d'être dit, mais. Oui. Il y, a, il y a deux choses, Monsieur le Professeur. La première, c'est que faire du droit dans une situation de conflit comme celle-là, ça peut sembler un peu, un peu curieux. Et en même temps, c'est « back to basic », je veux dire, c'est quand même très important. Alors, euh, on voit le, la, la difficulté euh, qu'ont euh, nos citoyens à avoir confiance euh, dans leur politique. Euh, vous êtes en train de nous dire que l'ONU n'a pas vraiment respecté les règles dans un conflit qui nous émeut tous. Et donc ça, ça me pose un problème. Donc moi, je vais vous poser une question de juriste, parce que je suis avocat. Et ma question est, comment ça se passe dans les zones de conflit C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'on a des cas identiques Est-ce que vous avez une jurisprudence en la matière Ou est-ce que la, le traitement du conflit du Yémen est, est très spécifique Parce que ça, c'est aussi important. Et la deuxième chose, parce que vous êtes ici au Sénat, 
et que nous sommes au moins deux sénateurs, sans compter ceux qui vont regarder après, parce qu'ils auront conscience de ce qu'ils ont manqué. Euh, la deuxième question, c'est, on a parlé il y a des années et des années déjà sous l'égide de Robert Badinter d'une réforme de l'ONU. Est-ce que, est que vous pensez qu'on pourrait, euh, avec peut-être certains de vos collègues, organiser un groupe d'experts pour que, si effectivement euh, il y a un dysfonctionnement, euh, on pourrait, ici ou ailleurs, faire des, des propositions constructives pour que ça ne se reproduise pas Parce que euh, si tout ça euh, est exactement à ces effets-là, c'est-à-dire... Euh, finalement empêcher euh, les partis euh, de se rapprocher au profit d'un tiers euh, qui n'est pas fiable. Euh, S'il y a des manquements avec la communication qu'il y a eu légitimement sur ce conflit du Yémen, encore une fois, monsieur l'ambassadeur, qui nous a tous beaucoup émus, euh, ma question est celle-là. Donc, un, euh, comment ça se passe dans les autres conflits Quelle est la jurisprudence en la matière Et la deuxième chose, c'est est-ce que vous avez des préconisations euh, en tant que professeur de droit de ce sujet, ou est-ce qu'il faut qu'on fasse une prochaine table ronde uniquement sur le droit de la guerre euh, avec d'autres professeurs, vos collègues, euh, des membres de l'ONU, euh, euh, le secrétaire général adjoint Philippe Douste-Blasi, euh, euh, qui est tout à fait disponible pour venir discuter dans cette maison qui est la sienne. Euh, voilà, j'avais ces deux questions qui sont des questions de droit. Et comme on fait du droit, une fois de temps en temps, ce n'est pas désagréable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those, 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 those are excellent questions, and they show us the, the precise direction in which the conversation has to go. So they, 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 these, these are absolutely perfect questions to ask. Regarding uh, law in wartime, law... Law is everywhere. Law is, is, is necessary. Wars have to end at some point. They need to be structured in some way. Basic conditions on, on the treatment of prisoners of war, uh, basic guarantees for being able to sign a peace treaty or even just a, a short-term truce must be guaranteed and must be framed in a certain way. Law is a, a language and, and a tool. In wartime, in situations comparable to Yemen, concerning the international law case, cases. The, the, the most obvious examples, you know, Rwa Rwanda, Sierra Leone, uh, the former Yugoslavia, all situations that ended in a, in a fairly innovative, sui generis, often ostensibly different, but in essence, identical set of solutions. They can take the form of amnesties. Excellent amnesty laws have been designed, and there's fantastic research done what type of amnesties work, what type, type of amnesties don't work. Truth and reconciliation commissions. Hybrid, court, hybrid courts, in which case the affected state feels that they still have the sovereignty and the capacity to pursue justice domestically, but for the sake of transparency and technical capabilities, they invite other large states and even UN organs to participate in setting up a hybrid court. These, these are, you are absolutely right. There are tribal resolution methods as well, and they, they, some of these have weaknesses, they all have different features, and we have decades of experience to build on. The most important thing before any of them can begin is establishing the facts. So for the group of experts to squander this opportunity is particularly egregious in my view, precisely because it stops or infects and all future solutions that, that might become possible. Regarding your second question, it, I think there are two, two, the answer has to come in two parts. The, I, I, I apologize. The, 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 my sense is that the, uh, the group of experts are fundamentally mis, misguided. They, they are, have tried to use a completely implausible set of war crime allegations to try to force the party's hand and to try to scare them to change their conduct. But this, this type of irresponsible statements and accusations always backfire, as in fact they did. And I'm speaking about the, the group of experts in general. 
The second part of the question concerns corruption, and that's why the news concerning the chairman are so, are so worrying. So if we, we had a different seminar and we collected experts, they would continue the work that the coalition's lawyers and completely independent public lawyers have already started to do, which is to show the numbers of ways in which the group of experts, two reports, are fundamentally flawed and unreliable and try to come up with better solutions. This can, this can correct some of the mistakes from method to fact, but the suspicion of corruption also needs to be addressed separately. I beg your pardon, just an additional point, but, but do you think that we, we may have to implement something like a, a rule of transparency, a guide of, like a declaration um, to prevent conflict of interest and those kind of things because um, uh, we now have to do that. We have a special register as an MP and it's absolutely normal and regular but you know at the same time if you, you want to uh, to be reliable at this level like United Nation um, you, you cannot um, be, s be um, mislead um, by, uh, by something like a conflict of interest, which is exactly the kind of poison that poisons the public life. So um, my question is that maybe we have to work on something which would be a register uh, to, to have a declaration because, you know, he is, he is this guy, I don't know him, um, I have no, um, nothing against the, the, the chairman, but the point is that if you are taking some, some subject, uh, you can just uh, make a declaration to, to just for transparency reasons. And, and then um, as soon as it's transparent, there is no problem because the people can um, read uh, like a, a double, double time the same yes. thing. So m maybe we have to work on this kind of things for the um, uh, United Nations experts. That would, be, that, that would be absolutely fantastic. And we, and we have seen signs and we see a need. The president of the ICJ, President Yusuf, stood up last year when he addressed the UN General Assembly. And he said that, that ICJ judges have been, have also engaged in, in, in extremely lucrative arbitration work. That needs to stop. One ICC judge uh, floated the possibility of becoming an ambassador and the ICC reacted with a set of elementary guidelines to stop such conflicts of interest. <coughs> Mark Wolf in Boston has proposed an absolutely brilliant anti-corruption uh, court, specifically, specifically for international law. All this, happened in, all this happened within the last 12 months. No such rules apply to most, to most of international law, shockingly enough, and you are absolutely right. This, this, this would definitely be 90% of the solution. I think the remaining 10% would have to come from better institutional design. Because I think some of these institutions are, are not designed with, with sufficient clarity and transparency either. But yes, that, 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 that would be fantastic. And, and there is a need and there's a call for, for greater transparency in international law. We are going to work on it. <laughs> Monsieur l'ambassadeur, pouvez-vous réagir à ce stade de... Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, first, uh, uh, thank you very, I mean, I'm very grateful for your uh, presentation, which really clarified uh, something which is, uh, I really would like, uh, I mean, uh, to, to, to talk about it more and more in the future, uh, not only in this uh, meeting and also in the media and other things, uh, which is about... Uh, the report, which as you said, uh, last year report was just ignoring uh, what's happening and it was just only descriptive things which uh, they collected some data from some newspapers and wrote about it and it was some sort of a stereotype uh, attack against uh, the Yemeni legitimate government and against the coalition. Uh, second report, they started to be a little bit understandable. And I, we don't want to wait for the next year report and then the next year report. Uh, we expect the United Nations expertise to be more uh, uh,
professional, let us say, more, more advanced and more creative in what we should uh, uh, do in the future. Uh, I think there is, there is one essential point. They are lacking the fundamental issue for what's happening in Yemen. They are lacking that the reason and, uh, and the consequences for what's happening in Yemen is uh, the coup d'etat and the aggressiveness of the militia of Houthis. That, that's the fundamental issue. Uh, whatever happened after that is a details. Uh, anyway, any war in the world happens with its own details. And what's happening in Yemen, uh, as you know, everybody knows Yemen, uh, most uh, of you visited it, uh, have, have a, a unique circumstances, uh, have their own problem, especially uh, we have uh, from the last 30 years, uh, the problem of the South and the North, which is now coming on the table. And uh, concentrating on that, who it is, is the only problem, is not now uh, practical things to look forward. I think we should look forward how we can uh, look forward resolving things because there is no time. Everything is deteriorating. And as you know, the Middle East now is living in, uh, uh, in a very uh, unstable, let us say, this is the best word, in, uh, in, in some, some countries in agony. Uh, we always following what's happening in Iraq nowadays or in Syria or Libya and, uh, uh, and Yemen. Uh, so looking forward, we should be... Uh, what we, really what, what we are expecting from United Nations expertise. Bien, bah écoutez, je vais donner la parole à qui la souhaite. Peut-être juste vous demander, avant de poser la question, de, de vous présenter. Voilà. Bonjour, alors je suis Samba Doukouré, je suis journaliste pour euh, Sapir News. Et euh, j'ai une question euh, très euh, naïve, mais euh, euh, ce groupe euh, d'experts des Nations Unies, euh, pour quel, euh, quel intérêt ou contrainte euh, ferait qu'il euh, qu rende un rapport euh, qui est jugé quasiment malhonnête, ou en tout cas euh, pas, 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 pas suffisamment sérieux qu quelle, quelle, quelle contrainte ou quelle... Euh, euh, ou quels intérêts euh, font que, que, que cela arrive quoi, dans une nation aussi importante que les Nations Unies Voilà. Oui, je suis Patricia Lalonde, et je suis euh, ancienne députée européenne. Il se trouve que j'ai pas mal travaillé sur le sujet du Yémen. Euh, concernant le rapport de M. Jean Doudi, on a, on a, nous l'avons reçu au Parlement européen. C'est la première fois que j'entends qu'il y a eu une controverse par rapport à ce, à ce rapport. Enfin, la Commission, en tout cas, des droits de l'homme du Parlement européen n'avait pas, pas abordé ce sujet. La deuxième chose, c'est que, concernant les Nations Unies, moi, je voulais rendre hommage quand même à à l'énorme travail que fait Martin Griffiths, qui est l'envoyé spécial des Nations Unies, qui euh, a un travail très difficile pour lui. Je crois qu'il a pris le temps et il a eu le courage d'aller voir aussi du côté des vilains outils, si je puis dire, pas se contenter d'aller voir juste les Saoudiens, le gouvernement officiel du Yémen. Et, et il a eu ce courage, il a rencontré le, le Abdelmalek Al-Houthi, le... le le, le, leur leader, M. Machat, le ministre des Affaires étrangères, M. Alishra, il, il a vraiment vu tout le monde et je crois qu'il se donne beaucoup de mal. Il a failli réussir au moment, en décembre l'année dernière, au moment des accords de Stockholm. Il y avait vraiment une, une porte entrouverte là. Euh, il s'agissait notamment de, des échanges de prisonniers et puis du redéploiement à Odeda. Le déploiement, le déploiement devait avoir lieu. Il avait commencé. D'ailleurs, je devais même partir à cette époque-là avec, euh, avec Martin Griffiths pour assister au, déploiement, euh, au redéploiement des troupes à, à Odeda. Et il y a eu à nouveau un bombardement, et puis tout est parti à nouveau. Et puis alors là, c'est. Euh, bon, bah, après, je, je, 
je suppose que tout le monde ici connaît, connaît la suite, y compris la guerre dans la guerre, c'est-à-dire euh, ce qui s'est passé avec les Émirats arabes unis dans le sud, qui essayent de, de diviser, le, qui, essayent de diviser le, le, qui veulent la division du Yémen, la partition du Yémen. Voilà, donc je voulais dire que Martin Goulfis, même, même aujourd'hui, est en train de continuer alors que personne ne sait trop ce qui se passe. Et ce serait dommage qu'il qu abandonne parce que je crois que c'est un, un, des, un des rares envoyés spéciaux de tous les conflits que nous avons vus qui, qui se donnent autant, autant de mal. Voilà. Euh, Ali Meribi, rédacteur en chef du magazine Colonel Arab. Euh, juste un petit remarque, euh, tous les, les peuples euh, du Yémen et des peuples arabes, ils comprennent bien que c'est l'agression des régimes iraniens qui est euh, le responsable euh, des crises du Yémen et même les crises euh, ailleurs, dans, en Irak, en Syrie, au Liban, etc. Pourquoi il n'y a pas une euh, euh, solution de l'ONU ou ailleurs des, des autres pays du monde pour euh, arrêter ces agressions du régime iranien qui, ça commence depuis des années et des années, ce n'est pas récemment. J'aime bien avoir euh, pourquoi. Merci. Je vous laisse répondre. Au moins aux deux premières questions. La troisième, je ne suis pas sûr qu'elle relève d'une approche juridique. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Regarding why they, they, they produce such a bad report that is generally hard to take seriously, I, 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 I don't have a, a satisfying answer. I think my sense, as I mentioned, is, is that they try to scare the parties into action. But completely unfounded, implausible, and very, very badly argued war crimes allegations at this level of the UN is, banned, is a really poor choice when it comes to the means of accomplishing that. It, back, it, it is bound to backfire, and it did. And so, and so did, did the second report. And as I mentioned, that the, the press has raised questions about the chairman. So I, I, I don't have a satisfying answer, and, and I wish I did. But thank you for the question. Regarding Martin Griffiths, I, 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 I completely agree. He, he has done everything he could in very, very difficult circumstances. And he has received a great deal of criticism as well. But when one looks at particular acts, the way he conducted himself in, during his investigations has, has been nothing short of admirable. In, from, from, from what I have seen and from reports I have seen. He insists on talking to women, even when he's, he's kept away from women and only men are giving him information. He stops the situation and says, now I would like to speak to some women. Now, this is just based on what I have seen. So there might be valid criticisms against his work, but I, I, I completely agree that he has, he has performed admirably and conducted himself admirably as well. And I think part of, the, part of the explanation for the failure of his mission is not just the, the parties themselves, but the institution. So obviously you, you, you cannot facilitate peace when nobody is serious about accomplishing peace. However, the UN system as such ought, ought to be a, a more flexible, more pliable, more precise, and more transparent set of tools that he, he should have had at his disposal. Th thank you for the question. And thank you for the question as well. I have no idea. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot answer that question at all. That's far beyond my pay grade. The one, one thing that might be interesting is, is the cases in the, in, in the United States. So I have referred to the, to the Hamel cases in August of this year, U.S. courts have, have started to declare that Iran actively interferes, violates other nations' sovereignties, 
and they, they started uh, awarding multi-billion dollar compensation awards to Americans killed in Yemen by the Houthi, and they're awarding these against Iran in extremely well and lucidly argued and well-supported court decisions that showed the link between Iran and the Houthis and how the Houthis would not have been able to do anything that they have done so far without I Iran's support. So that there, there seems to be, again, the politics is not my field, but legally speaking, there seems to be a much more clear-eyed and well-argued approach in the U.S. to, to, to this question. Thank you. Um, may I tell you something just uh, um, it's very interesting to to have a unite uh, US uh, in the in the middle of uh, something regarding international law <laughs> because we just celebrate Jack Chirac some days ago and um, the totally illegal war in Iraq we are still paying. <laughs> because of this war. So thank you for reminding us that the uh, United States of America can deal with uh, international law. Moi qui ne suis pas juriste et simplement médecin, mais il y a ici des éminents juristes, pourriez-vous me rappeler ce qu'est la définition d'une guerre légale, s'il vous plaît Can I just add, add, add to this that, that, uh, that it is indeed extremely important to understand the law for what it is. It is a set of tools. It is a language. It can offer this range of solutions and it is up to the politicians and to the people to, to choose amongst them and to make them work. Which is why very often I, I have been teaching human rights for two decades. And most of my students are wondering that if we have these ideals and these laws on the books, why is there so much misery? And you have to explain that laws are not, they, they don't solve everything. But, we, but in order to solve anything, we have to get them right, which is not what the group of experts have done. Laurence Larour, journaliste pour l'actu, mon quotidien. Concernant les dispositions légales, voire discutables, qui ont été soulignées dans le traité sur les ventes d'armes de la France, les armes transférées, les armes par destination, qu'est-ce que le droit peut faire Qu'est-ce que les citoyens, qu'est-ce que tout un chacun peut faire Le droit en premier lieu, parce que c'est le thème de notre conférence. Vous, vous avez dit que, que vous enseignez vos étudiants que le droit peut être utilisé, que chacun peut l'utiliser. On a tous entendu que dans le rapport, on parlait de ventes discutables. La France a signé un traité qui prohibe les ventes par transfert quand elles peuvent être utilisées contre des populations et assimilées à des crimes de guerre. Donc... Euh You are absolutely right, and the report itself uh, discusses the, the, the complicity of the United States, of the UK and France, and, and of course Iran as well, in illegal arms transfers. And uh, uh, international criminal law has been changing quite a lot on this front. It is possible to become complicit in a, a war crime just by selling arms. So. Technically speaking, the group of experts had a point. However, there needs to be evidence, there needs to be a political decision, there needs to be demonstration, and then you know, the process is supposed to take its, co its natural course. Its natural course begins with inquiries and investigations and decisions by national authorities. 
So in the case of France, this is a, a, a conversation or dialogue for, for France to have before international criminal, criminal responsibility comes anywhere near the equation. So that's how the, the Rome Statute works, that's how the ICC works. The, the first port of call is always the, the state. And, and the state must have an opportunity to, to handle the matter for itself, first and foremost. So it's a, it's a, it's a French question, and, and the group of experts, again, has, I think, is trying to cut out in, a, in an unproductive way that particular tier that is recognized and, respect, and tremendously respected by international criminal law itself. Et ce sont des experts indépendants Vous parlez d'enquête de, nationale. Quel est le processus juridique Les autorités s'en remettent à des experts indépendants ou dans, dans Qui enquête Est-ce que ce sont des experts indépendants du gouvernement Again, this can vary from country to country, but the, the, the process begins by going to the police. And in a well-designed criminal justice system, if, if, if evidence is submitted, factual evidence is submitted, and, and numerous absolutely outstanding and landmark criminal, international criminal law cases began with somebody going to the police. I am a refugee in the country that, that I, I came from. These are the things that happened to me Now I have a European citizenship. Let me explain what happened. So that, that but again, I'm just giving you a very generic, generic scenario because it, it varies from country to country. But ideally, there could be fantastic, spectacular cases created out of a very simple police report when ordinary justice takes its proper course in a well-functioning democracy. It's a well-functioning democracy with a good legal system. It's a tremendously powerful thing. You beg your pardon. Do you, do you call so-called bad democracy um, like France? It's a bad democracy because France is selling weapons? Or what is the process of uh, being qualified of bad democracy? Uh, uh, thank you. A bad democracy would be a uh, country which is fulfills the, the superficial institutional requirements of a democracy, but the judiciary and the executive are not independent from each other, for instance. So the independence that the question related to can be found within France itself. That the, the independence experts are the French judges at the first step of the process. Fair enough. Faisal bin Hussain, CNS News. I can speak in English if you want. All right. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, all legal uh, aspect of this war is okay. It's very important, but wouldn't it be more important to stop the war first. And of course, countries like France, because we're in France, more obviously USA, UK, and maybe the European Union should would eventually pressure the two parties, which is, we know them, Saudi Arabia in one part because it's the strongest country in the area, and Iran, to stop the war. And then after that, we can see the legal question and what to do about what have been doing, what have been done during the war. Thank you. I, I again, I couldn't agree more. But to achieve such an ambitious and vitally important outcome, one has to use the right tools. So to sit around the table and conduct peace negotiations without understanding what an amnesty, how amnesty laws work, is just not going to work. So again, my very, very limited and technical point is that the group of experts' work is counterproductive, It is, it is counterproductive in a tremendously influential and important way 
because the technicality is matter by the time, but, well, not by the time, the matter already, especially as the questions become, uh, as the questions evolve, and you get to the transitional justice phase of Yemen, for instance. But this is just, I, I hope that makes some sense, but I, I hope that the ambassador can address the question as well, because it's an important point. Sorry. In this regard, that I think the United Nations and the international community will be uh, uh, soon disappointed uh, because uh, if we expect that uh, a group of militia like Houthis uh, understands what it means by peace, I think we are uh, making a, a very big mistake. Uh, militia of Houthis is the only uh, terrorist or violence organization who have got a chance of the last five years uh, under the uh, auspices of uh, Martin Griffith and before that there was uh, uh, Mr. Gamal bin Omar and before that also uh, Ismail bin Sheikh and uh, there was more than five meetings with them. We are trying to uh, uh, negotiate with them and to ask them a very simple question, what do you want? And they never uh, said what they want. Till today, uh, I can't challenge anybody uh, in, the, in Yemen or outside Yemen uh, to tell me what the Houthis want, really. Till today, they never said what they want. We uh, negotiated with them in Geneva, uh, starting from 2015, and we went on uh, to Kuwait, and we spent uh, 100 days uh, with them. Uh, and the end of the 100 days, we are due to, uh, to sign some sort of, uh, let us say, a roadmap to go in tours, and they just declined and refused. Uh, because they got some instructions from uh, Iranian regime to stop that. Uh, then we went, uh, as mentioned, to Stockholm in December last year. Uh, until today, nothing have uh, happened uh, regarding the Stockholm gentleman agreement, or the Houthis are not a gentleman. Uh, they, they are a group of uh, terrorists behaving same like uh, Daesh, uh, in the same way. Uh, that's, uh, uh, in spite of that, uh, we still uh, looking forward uh, to have some sort of uh, uh, a settlement, some sort of an agreement, some sort of uh, uh, a peace process. Uh, but as I said from the beginning, uh, to have a peace process, you need a partner. You, you need a person who understand what what means by peace, what needs by the aspects of the law, which I think they are lacking. Pour, euh, <coughs> pardon. Pour rebondir sur ce que disait monsieur tout à l'heure, je crois que la, la priorité serait quand même d'essayer d'arrêter de, la guerre. Et quels que soient les mérites de négociateurs de l'ONU, il faut admettre que ça patine. Alors, question aux juristes. Est-ce que euh, la, la, la nomination d'un médiateur euh, euh, différent, du type, euh, par exemple, Pakistan, qui possède dans son sein les deux, les deux communautés, ou au contraire, euh, un pays très lointain, comme un pays nordique, est-ce que ça ne relancerait pas la machine qui semble un peu bloquée maintenant Je ne parle pas de la France parce que comme tout à l'heure le sénateur me l'a dit, la France a l'image d'être très impliquée là-dedans. Mais notre, notre président a, a envie de jouer le médiateur international. Il a les capacités, il, il a le tonus, il a, il, il a quelque chose. Donc peut-être que la France aussi, mais que, que, commençons par des pays qui sont, qui sont soit impliqués parce qu'ils ont des nations, des, ont des, des religions à peu près équivalentes au Yémen, soit qu'ils sont complètement lointains, au contraire.
Thank you. That's that. That again is an absolutely vital question, and this is, but it is more political than legal. Based on what I know, you are absolutely right. A, a country that has no links to the region or is sufficiently distant from the region usually works better as a mediator. However, the other thing that we have seen in Yemen and other conflict zones and conflict situations before is that the parties have to often go through a, a, a learning curve, essentially. They, they have to learn to trust the mediator, and the mediator fails. Eventually, the parties realize that the mediator failed because of them, not because of the mediator. So when Martin Griffiths, for instance, if the parties come back to the table and they have gone through multiple stages of unsuccessful negotiation with a mediator whom they did begin to trust, that often leads to a better next step, even though the previous step has failed, than just getting rid of mediator after mediator and, uh, and starting with fresh faces. So that, that, that has been the experience in, in conflict, that if, if the if you change mediators too often, you lose credibility. The mediators lose credibility, and the parties think that they can indefinitely postpone this story. While if they have to experience the failure together and they are still stuck with the same mediator, they learn how to conduct themselves better over time. It's, that's, that, is a, that has been the general scenario so far. Thank you. Non, je voudrais juste demander si vous êtes au courant, parce qu'actuellement, je crois qu'il y a une négociation actuellement entre l'Arabie saoudite et, et le gouvernement de facto de, de Sanaa. Je voulais savoir si, si vous pouvez nous en dire plus là-dessus. Et je sais que le, que le président irakien Al-Madi était, euh, était à Riyad il n'y a pas longtemps, dans le cadre de cette médiation. Et effectivement, on parle de la médiation pakistanaise. Voilà, je voulais savoir si vous en savez plus là-dessus. Yes. Thank you. Is that your question? For, 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 for the ambassador. Sorry. I think uh, for, for the time being, there is no uh, mediation except what is uh, uh, under uh, Martin Griffith. Uh, and uh, everybody was. Uh, hoping and trying his best to, uh, to help Yemen uh, to overcome this problem. Uh, but uh, uh, I can assure you that the war is, is not a, a, a proxy war, so we can put pressure on uh, uh, the coalition or, uh, uh, I mean, uh, or, or anybody else to stop it. The war is started, as I said, by the the group of the militia who got the full support uh, from uh, Iran. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, they want to create uh, some sort of uh, new Hezbollah in, uh, in Yemen. This, this is the, the, the ultimate goal. They, they, uh, I think they think or they can, they realize they cannot take over the whole Yemen. Uh, uh, everybody is against them, maybe except Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, so they are, they are trying their best to get hold and to stay as much as possible holding Sana'a and Hudaydah. Uh, they are trying their best to show that uh, they can strike uh, and send uh, drones uh, and explosions to uh, uh, Saudi or to anybody else. Uh, they are playing on time. Uh, but what, what is the basis for their holding uh, Sana'a and uh, Yemen, they don't have. I think this is, this is the, the main issue which we start always to discuss uh, before. The war will stop if the Houthis want to stop it. If the Houthis refuse to stop the war, we will continue like this. Uh, this is the only issue which I think we have as international community to concentrate. If anybody have a magic uh, power, 
to, uh, to, uh, to pursue the Houthis, to stop the war, then it will be stopped. Otherwise, it will continue, unfortunately. Oui, peut-être apporter une réflexion toute personnelle. Quelle est la nature de la guerre au Yémen, finalement Vous dites, Excellence, ce n'est pas une guerre par procuration. Très bien. En même temps, l'intervention de ces deux grandes puissances du Moyen-Orient, que sont l'Iran d'un côté, et vous l'évoquez par rapport aux outils et l'Arabie de l'autre, qui intervient finalement hors son territoire, est une réalité. Et pour rebondir sur ce que disait monsieur quand j'ai posé la question de la définition de qu'est-ce qu'une guerre légale, vous avez évoqué euh, saint Thomas d'Aquin. Mais sauf erreur de ma part, alors c'est vrai que je ne le lis pas tous les jours comme livre de chevet, mais j'ai quelques souvenirs d'études. Euh, le premier critère euh, d'une guerre juste selon euh, Thomas d'Aquin, c'est euh, la présence de puissance publique c'est-à-dire d'État, même si le terme à l'époque n'a pas la signification qu'il aurait aujourd'hui au sens d'État-nation. Or, force, force est d'admettre qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons au Yémen un gouvernement légitime, hein, c'est le mot qui a été employé, les outils qui ne sont pas puissance d'État, et je fais une analyse très littérale, hein, il n'y a aucun, aucun parti pris de ma part, d'où la question que j'ai posée, qu'est-ce que la guerre au Yémen est-ce une guerre civile Mais si c'est une guerre, une, pardonnez-moi l'expression, une simple guerre civile, d'où vient l'intervention d'autres puissances Ou est-ce une guerre par procuration Monsieur l'ambassadeur, vous dites non, mais on peut quand même avoir quelques doutes. Ou est-ce peut-être au fond un peu les deux mélangés et euh, ce qui rend euh, l'analyse tant politique que juridique, parce qu'on a bien vu que dans notre discussion, euh, les deux étaient intimement liés. Votre analyse juridique est passionnante, mais on a vu très vite que dans les interventions des uns et des autres, et c'est en doute à ce bien comme ça, la politique a pris le pas. Donc finalement, au-delà de savoir si elle est légale, qu'est-ce que la guerre au Yémen Thank you. That's, that's a very, very important question. And again, it is difficult to characterize for the precise reasons that you outlined. It can be described as a proxy war, it can be described as a, as a civil war, and it can be described as a transnational war as well. So su several international law categories fit. But instead of trying to settle that, the only, pay, the only point that I would like to try to make is that, is that the responsibility of non-state actors has recently become re reassessed in international criminal law. It used to be the case that only states could be culpable and or particular individuals acting on the orders of, of such states. And since the Tajish decision, you know, the international criminal law responsibility of non-state actors and state actors have been converging. So many of the categories, legal categories that we have been using turned out to be not particularly useful for conflicts such as the former Yugoslavia and now Yemen. This is why in my written statement, I, I, I try to draw, draw attention to areas of, of international criminal law that are evolving and the group of experts are, seem to be unaware. And so I'm entirely certain that the definition of war will change as well. Aquinas pointed out that there has to be a properly constituted public authority to declare a war. It has to be in a just cause, and it has to be conducted through just means. But the, the recent concepts of, of proportionality, for instance, and the distinction between civilian and military objects of attack also need to adjust to the, rea to the realities on the ground. And I'm sort of pleased to say that the, the, international, the community of international lawyers, including the practicing international lawyers at the UN, are aware of this, and they are rewriting international law accordingly. In August this year, the International Law Commission published its usual findings. It's a, it's a fantastic achievement as well, and it is something that we can use straight away in attributing responsibility to various actors in Yemen. So international criminal law is changing. It is trying to catch up with, with the complexities. 
but the group of experts don't see, doesn't seem to be aware of this. Bien, mais écoutez, je pense qu'on... Ah, oui. Alors, bonjour à tous. Je me présente à Kilad Bichy, maître de conf à l'Université Paris 8. Donc, je suis docteur en philosophie politique. J'ai beaucoup travaillé sur la question terroriste. Donc, la question que je, enfin, que je veux poser à monsieur le juriste, euh, vous ne pensez pas qu'aujourd'hui... Euh, vous avez parlé des négociations. Vous ne pensez pas qu'aujourd'hui, on n'est plus dans, sur ce plan de négociation avec les, les outils parce que euh, il faut plus aller utiliser euh, enfin, la voie militaire pour euh, essayer de neutraliser, si on peut dire. Euh, le, parce que pour moi, enfin, pour moi et pour euh, certaines études, on les considère comme un groupe terroriste aujourd'hui. Et euh, est-ce que euh, le Yémen ne peut pas justement s'appuyer sur ses pays voisins, comme l'Arabie saoudite et les Émirats, pour qu'ils puissent s'en sortir Voilà, merci. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it would be extremely helpful to, to improve the coordination between, between neighboring countries. But as far as the Houthis are concerned, describing them as, as terrorists or as last year's group of experts, the, sorry, as the group of experts did in last year's report as rebels, which I thought was far too romantic, um, doesn't matter to a certain extent. The actual label that we apply is, is, is important when it comes to legal definitions. But if you look at it as a political theory, theorist as a po or, or a political scientist, you will always encounter the same elementary group of people engaged in reiterated action. So if you classify the Houthis as terrorists, a, a range of legal means become available to, to you. You can do things to them that you couldn't do to them otherwise. But you're not going to stop them. So negotiations remain, I believe, tremendously important, and it is, which is why it's useful to think of them in a context in which interaction reoccurs and reoccurs and reoccurs again. So learning becomes possible. So yeah, I, I did a PhD in political science as well, which is why the, 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 the political science approach is, is particularly dear to my heart, where it complements the legal one, which is why I think it's an excellent question. The, the, you have to, create context, sorry, conditions in which these reiterated long-term interactions become ideally shorter and actually productive. They, they, they can lead to a lasting settlement. And law is subservient to this political purpose. So if, 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 if this makes any sense. So if law allows, if you, if you label someone a, a war criminal and publish his name, and you do this on the grounds of very flimsy, insufficient evidence, they will stop working with you. That's what the group of experts did last year. And surprise, surprise, the coalition withdrew its cooperation completely. That was a, that was a completely miscalculated political action. Sorry. So that's, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Euh, en fait, euh, José-Marie Bell, je suis ethnologue et spécialiste du Yémen et de la région depuis, depuis 45 ans. Je, je voudrais juste apporter un, un petit éclairage personnel concernant l'évolution de la région, puisqu'on en a, euh, cela a été évoqué. J'ai très longuement fréquenté toute la région du nord du Yémen euh, de, depuis donc 45 ans, et en particulier la région frontalière. Euh, il se trouve que pendant quelques décennies, euh, les années 70-80, comme vous le savez, il y avait une communauté euh, juive euh, qui était à la frontière du Yémen du Nord. Et cette euh, communauté juive vivait, pour ainsi dire, en, en paix avec les voisins. Quoi qu'il en soit, euh, nous étions euh, à la frontière avec l'Arabie la, saoudite et quoi que qui se passait de, de ces journées là-bas, il y avait toujours des contrôles policiers, quelques difficultés, quelques risques, bien entendu. Et, et malgré tout, cela fonctionnait. Et peu à peu, année après année, dans les années 70, 80, 90, quand on y arrivait, eh bien, on, je sentais que la tension se présentait. Bien entendu, la communauté juive avait tendance à, à partir. Je leur disais, 
essayez de ne pas partir, votre patrimoine est celui du Yémen et c'est extrêmement important, mais enfin, il en était ainsi. Et euh, je constatais qu'avec la montée de, de l'intégrisme des guerres ici et là, euh, que, évidemment, les tensions étaient de plus en plus difficiles. Et comme quoi, alors qu'on parle des Houthis, les Houthis, euh, c'est dans une région aussi entre Amran et Saada, où il y a une petite, un petit village qui s'appelle Earth, hein, que vous connaissez sans doute. Et, et je constatais que par là-bas, euh, à chaque fois que j'y allais, c'était de plus en plus dur, compliqué, et qu'il y avait des soi-disant des instituts euh, islamiques qui se créaient plus ou moins dans la caillasse, ici et là, et que c'était de plus en plus tendu. Et je constatais cette chose-là, effectivement, qui gagnait en contradiction avec le régime Sanaani, le régime de Sana, le régime de Taïs, bien entendu, et l'Arabie saoudite. Comme quoi, on parle des Houthis, qui sont effectivement un, un, mouvement, euh, un mouvement intégriste et qui s'est développé dans cette région du Nord et qui, peu à peu, a gagné le, sur le Sud. Mais en gagnant sur le Sud, c'était aussi contre Al-Wahada, contre l'unité du Yémen. Il a fallu mettre la, faire une guerre rapide, euh, n'est-ce pas, en, en 1994, euh, contre Aden, notamment, contre le régime. Et cela a affaibli considérablement toute la région du Nord et le pouvoir Sanaani, de Sana. Et avec Abdallah Saleh, et peu à peu, bien sûr, toute la considération dans la région et dans le monde, avec les attentats, avec l'affaiblissement de régimes divers, eh bien, le, le pays s'est retrouvé en déliquescence, euh, peu à peu, avec évidemment des orientations diverses. Et, et l'Arabie saoudite s'est retrouvée, pour ainsi dire, coincée dans cette aventure, comme tout autre. Euh, avec le temps, il faut y penser. Depuis cinq ans, il y a cette guerre tra tra tragique. Il y a les mines qui sont euh, déployées dans la Tihama et ailleurs. Il y a ce peuple qui souffre et nous compatissons. Chers amis, nous sommes là aussi et ce n'est pas grand chose. Et que peut-on faire pour arrêter cette guerre Parce qu'ensuite, il y a la suite de cette guerre. Il va falloir penser les plaies, il va falloir déminer, il va falloir déployer de l'argent et les Nations Unies et l'Europe doivent y participer. Merci. Si je peux apporter une petite remarque supplémentaire à ce que M. José Maribel vient de dire, les implantations d'institutions ou de, de camps d'entraînement de, religieux et parareligieux dans la région du nord, du nord Yémen, euh, ont été créés et financés par des groupes salafistes et supportés par des Saoudiens. Et ce n'est pas une des mineures raisons pour le mouvement Houthi, euh, la plus grande de ces implantations qui étaient ouvertement terroristes, j'utilise le mot avec prudence, ouvertement terroristes, avaient environ 10 000 soi-disant étudiants au plein cœur de la région tribale euh, des Zaïdites, dont euh, cette famille euh, de Saïd, de Houth, euh, euh, est le porte-parole. Donc, il y a des raisons euh, qui sont bien antérieures, bien antérieures à l'éclatement même de la guerre et euh, euh, des raisons que l'on peut résumer dans, peut-être avec le mot... Euh, souvent un peu surutilisé d'identité, une identité que aussi bien les Saoudiens, par l'implantation de ces, ces colonies salafistes et l'ancien gouvernement Abdallah Saleh, euh, ont essayé de briser en faveur euh, d'une soi-disant euh, identité nationale qui... Euh, si, on, si on mesure bien, si on connaît bien le Yémen, n'est autre qu'une 
classe sociale qui s'est créée après l'indépendance et qui ne comprend, comprend pas le peuple normal, même pas le peuple des régions sudistes, je ne parle pas du sud en tant que tel, mais des régions méridionales du Yémen du Nord, mais une classe qui a prospéré aux frais du pays et qui se croit classe dominante parce qu'elle partage le mode de vie de l'Occident. Merci. Bien, bah écoutez, merci. Je dois rendre sinon l'antenne, du moins la salle. Euh, on voit bien que le, le sujet parti de considération juridique a évolué vers une approche politique et je dirais c'est bien normal. Tout ce qu'on peut souhaiter, et là c'est le médecin qui, qui reparle, c'est que cette guerre cesse un jour. Enfin, moi, dans une autre vie, j'ai participé en Irak à, à une opération humanitaire et pour avoir vécu ce que... Ces, ces choses-là de très près en tant que médecin, on ne peut souhaiter que, que cela s'arrête dans les plus brefs délais. Je ne sais pas, compte tenu des informations actuelles, si on peut être pessimiste ou optimiste. Essayons d'être réaliste en tout cas et de bonne volonté. Merci.